Now we're about to dive into the heart of musculoskeletal anatomy for step one, the upper extremities. Let's start with the anatomy of the brachial plexus, which serves as a good conceptual foundation for understanding the rest of the upper limb. Now when I look at the diagram of a brachial plexus, it sort of looks like a devil to me, and certainly learning it can be a bit hellish as well. Bear with me. See the horns here? Nose here. Strong chin here. Now this funny little drawing may help you remember where the divisions are for this complicated structure. Let's go through it formally, starting with the nerve roots, C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. Now keep in mind, however, that although there are cervical nerves 1 through 8, there are actually only how many cervical vertebrae? That's right, 7 cervical vertebrae. The C8 nerve comes out below the C7 vertebra. All the other cervical nerve roots come out above their vertebrae. Let's look at the trunks next, the upper, middle, and lower trunk. After that, you get to the divisions. This is the devil's eyes, where we see some crossing over as well, so the names get complicated and fairly unimportant. Next are the cords. These cords are named relative to their position to the axillary artery. The posterior cord splits off into the major extensor nerves of the limb, the axillary and radial nerve, so of course, a posterior cord lesion will cause problems with extension. These are part of the last segment, the branches. The others come off the lateral and medial cords and form the musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar nerves. As you can see in this schematic, there are five different sets of levels overall in the brachial plexus. You can remember the order of these levels with the acronym, Randy Travis Drinks Cold Beer. These next couple of pictures are relatively high yield pictures of the major nerve branches and associated dermatomes for the upper extremity, including the hand. Now it's worth having a rough idea of where each dermatome lies in your mind because many questions will describe certain paresthesias and certain patches of skin and require you to know what nerve is involved. So just spend some time here looking at this diagram which shows cervical nerve dermatomes. Now as you recall from embryology, as the fetus develops, the arms rotate. And you can see that here, how the nerve roots seem to twist around the arm as compared with the rest of the body. A point of reference I like to use is C7, which is the key root to using your middle finger. I had an anatomy professor help us remember this by flipping the entire class off and taunting us, C7, ha, C7. From there, the thumbs are C6 and deltoids are C5. Now working the other way around, C8 is the fourth finger and T1 on the forearm. Not so bad. Flash quiz. Which nerve root innervates the skin of only one digit? C7. Let's take a quick look at the dermatomes of the hand. You'll need a bit more detailed knowledge of this area beyond the nerve roots. On the palm, the skin here is innervated by the ulnar nerve. And here, the median nerve. Have you ever had your pinky finger fall asleep? It was probably because you fell asleep studying on your elbow, where the ulnar nerve was compressed. What about the dorsal side of the hand? Here we see the ulnar, median, and radial nerve all at work innervating the skin. The ulnar nerve wraps around to the lateral part of the back of the hand. The median nerve wraps over the top, and the radial nerve innervates the skin on the medial dorsum. Let's say you are a good medical student studying hard on a Saturday night and you fall asleep in your chair. The next morning you wake up and can't extend your hand. You say to yourself, I have wrist drop. You can't even feel the back of your hand. What happened? Well, you have Saturday night palsy from falling asleep in your chair. What nerve did you compress all night? The radial nerve, or the great extensor nerve. It was compressed by the arm of the chair in the spiral groove of the humerus. If you weren't such a great medical student, you might also get this from being too drunk or otherwise intoxicated to get to bed, hence the name Saturday night palsy. Flash quiz. What nerve innervates the highlighted skin? The radial nerve. Let's finish off this fact with a high yield table. First, the axillary nerve. Please always keep the axillary nerve in mind when you're presented with a patient who sustained an anterior shoulder dislocation. Proximal humerus fractures are also events that can lead to axillary nerve dysfunction. But a common way this concept presents on an exam is a patient who recently sustained a shoulder injury and is now being seen in the outpatient setting with a complaint of numbness over the lateral aspect of their shoulder. 
What they're most likely hinting at is that the patient suffered an anterior shoulder dislocation. The shoulder was then reduced. However, he or she still has complaints of numbness secondary to an axillary nerve neuropraxia. Next is the musculocutaneous nerve, which is derived from which portion of the brachial plexus? Good, the lateral cord. Probably one of the lower yield injuries on this table, but don't forget that this nerve gives off a branch that provides sensation over the lateral aspect of your forearm. Do you know what branch this is? Good, the lateral antebrachial cutaneous nerve. Now yes, the musculotaneous nerve also innervates your biceps, and that's important because obviously biceps, so the patient may have weakness with elbow flexion and forearm supination, but again, the sensory deficit is a concept examiners love to test on. Next is the radial nerve. The wrist drop resulting from a park bench-induced compression of the radial nerve continues to pop up on exams every year. Patient goes out on a Saturday night, has a quick rest with his arm draped over the back of a bench, wakes up with a wrist drop due to wrist extensor weakness. Another common testable concept is fractures of the humerus. Oftentimes, this question stem describes something extravagant, like a gunshot or high-energy contact injury to the arm. The patient will now be complaining of wrist drop symptoms or dorsal forearm sensory loss. Remember that the radial nerve courses along the posterior aspect of the humerus in the spiral groove and can be injured anywhere along its course. However, mid-shaft humeral fractures tend to be a common presentation examiners will provide for you on a test. And quickly, if a patient sustained a gunshot wound and has a broken humerus and radial nerve deficits, which vascular structure do you think might also be compromised? Good, the deep brachial artery, as this is the structure that runs with the radial nerve in close proximity throughout the arm. All right, next up is the median nerve. It gets a little bit confusing here, but knowing your normal anatomy, such as where the median nerve innervates, which muscles will help. Let's talk about a couple lesions you might see on your test, starting with ape hand. Now, when your hand is at rest, your thumb rests in a position that's slightly volar to the rest of your digits, meaning if you laid the back of your hand flat on a table, your thumb rests slightly raised away from your palm. This is due to the tonic action of your thenar muscles. Can you take a guess at which ones are working here? Good, the abductor pollicis brevis and the opponent's pollicis. In a distal median nerve lesion, such as a wrist laceration or trauma to the thenar eminence itself, the thumb loses that ability to perform thumb abduction in opposition. Abduction is actually when the thumb is brought further away from the palm in the plane that's perpendicular to the palm. So imagine in this picture, the thumb is brought straight towards you. That's abduction. Thumb opposition is performed by opponent's pollicis and allows your thumb to touch the tip of the remaining digits of your hand. In the ape hand lesion, the thumb loses its ability to rest in an abducted position and also opposed to each other digit. So it rests in an adducted position with the remaining digits, which is very similar to how an ape's hand looks. Another condition is what's called Pope's blessing. It occurs in a more proximal median nerve lesion, such as a supracondylar humerus fracture, and results in the inability of the patient to flex her index finger and middle fingers while trying to make a fist. Now this is an important concept to remember. The stem will often describe whether or not the patient is asked to perform a certain movement with their hand, and then they'll show you an image of what their hand looks like during their attempt to perform a movement, such as making a fist. Now, to fully flex the index and the middle fingers, what muscle do you think the patient needs to do this? Good, the flexor digitorum profundus, which receives a portion of its innervation more proximally by the median nerve branches. So if the median nerve was injured more proximally, it would not be able to innervate the FDP to the index and the long finger, and during a fist movement, the patient's first and second fingers would be held in extension. Next up is the ulnar nerve. Examiners have recently started asking about ulnar nerve compression that occurs at the elbow in what's known as cubital tunnel syndrome. Repetitive activities that involve elbow flexion often bring about the symptoms that are characterized by numbness and tingling in the medial one and a half digits. Oftentimes, the stem might describe a patient who gets numbness and tingling in these digits every time they use their cell phone or hold a newborn or anything that flexes the arm and holds it in that position for a long period of time. 
The syndrome may progress to muscle deficits, which happens later on in the disease, but what type of muscle deficit do you think the patient might have? Well, they could have a deficit in anything that's innervated by the ulnar nerve beyond the elbow, such as flexor carpi ulnaris. What do you think that would result in? Good, that would result in radial deviation with wrist flexion because the FCU is weak. Now, if the patient was asked to make a fist and they had a proximal ulnar nerve lesion, what do you think the ring and pinky fingers would do? Well, they would probably stay extended. They couldn't flex because it's the ulnar nerve that innervates the FDP muscles to those two digits. So just be sure to keep in mind that if you have a patient who's got paresthesias, numbness tingling, and the ulnar nerve distribution during activities of elbow flexion, and they're starting to have some of the muscular deficits, think about cubital tunnel syndrome. Finally, we have the recurrent branch of the median nerve. Honestly, it's probably not an incredibly high yield topic as far as step one goes, but it is an incredibly important structure clinically that is always feared and protected. It's often referred to as the million dollar nerve due to the high legal costs incurred by surgeons upon accidental damage during surgery. Yes, you can damage it from a superficial palmar laceration. However, a more interesting way to remember this structure is to know that its anatomy is highly variable around the carpal tunnel. Sometimes it travels deep to the carpal tunnel, sometimes superficial, sometimes it goes straight through the transverse carpal ligament. So this anatomic variation puts it in danger of iatrogenic damage during an otherwise relatively low-risk surgery such as a carpal tunnel release. So iatrogenic damage during this surgery is how it may present on a test. Now if it were cut, what deficits would the patient have after surgery? Good, they'd have weakness in thumb opposition, abduction, and flexion. Remember, OF for opponens pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, and the superficial portion of flexor pollicis brevis. These are the muscles innervated by the recurrent branch of the median nerve. You can also remember the surgeon who cuts the recurrent branch of the median nerve is an OF.